Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Hayekadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. What a joy to serve the Lord. Now, I trust you are feeling blessed in Jesus, bright and happy this morning. Well, we are continuing our study in the book of Hebrews, and today we're going to pick up at verse 5. Now, yesterday we read of a severe warning for the people of God of how attentive we need to be in our Christian lives, in our Christian duty. And so he picks up by saying, For unto the angels hath he, the Lord Jesus, not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. There is a new world order, but it's not the new world order that humanity is seeking to achieve. It's the new world order that Jesus is going to bring about, and actually, it's going back to the time of Adam and Eve in the garden, in original perfection, as he originally intended all things to be. Now, he says, one in a certain place testified. He's speaking of Job here. Job has testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him? Now, this is taken from chapter 7 of Job and verse 17, where Job says, What is man, that thou shouldest magnify him, and that thou shouldest set thine heart upon him, and that thou shouldest visit him every morning? When you wake up in the morning, the Lord Jesus is waiting for you. And how often we become busy in our day and we forget that he is there. We forget to say good morning, Lord. We forget to seek his advice and his direction for the day that we are about to enter into. And that's what Job says. What is man that you would visit him every morning and try him every moment? Every moment of your life, you are being tested to see what you are going to do and how you are going to keep the Lord Jesus first in your life. And so back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, he says, What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visitest him? Now, there were many years that I read this passage, and I thought that this was speaking of Jesus. But when read in context, we see this is speaking of humanity. He continues in verse 7 and says, You've made him, man, a little lower than the angels. You've crowned him with glory and honor, and you have set him over all the works of your hands. This would be the beasts of the earth. This would be the fowl of the air. This would be the fish of the sea. He says, You have put all things in subjection under his man's feet. For in that he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. And this seems to indicate that when we arrive in the new kingdom, when we reign with Christ upon the new earth, that the angels are going to be in subjection unto us. Because it seems to be saying that even though all things on earth have been placed under man, there are still things yet to be put under man. And if those things are yet still to come, then they will come in the new kingdom. He says in verse 9, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And what this means is that Jesus was made flesh. In verse 16, it says, verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham or humanity. And so humanity right now is a little lower than the angels. But again, it appears that that will not always be so. So it says, Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Every man, every woman, every boy, every girl has an opportunity to become a partaker of the blessing that Jesus accomplished on the cross if they will bow in humble surrender to him and serve him as Lord and King. For it became him, Jesus, for whom are all things, 
and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Now, in chapter 5, verse 9, it says, Though he were a son, though Jesus were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And you and I know that to be true. We learn from our sufferings. That's what Romans chapter 5, verse 3 says when it reads, We glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience experience, experience hope, and hope makes not ashamed. And so Jesus has given us the perfect example that by the things we suffer in this life, and these can be things that we can suffer outside of our control, and these can be things that we suffer inside our control. The things that we sacrifice. Sacrifice means suffering. So the things that you choose to sacrifice in this life on his behalf make you a more obedient servant of the Lord Jesus. And so we learn, we see an example from our captain of our salvation who was made perfect through sufferings. And that's what sanctification is. It is holiness. It is a lifestyle. It is the choices that we make. And we understand, and hear me, friend, we understand that the less of us automatically the more of him. The more of us, the less of him. And this is why the choices that we make in every minute detail of our lives is so important. For both he that sanctifieth, in verse 11, and who are sanctified are all one. And that is why he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Because just as he made sacrifices in his life, so too we share in his suffering by making sacrifices in our life. And he says to them in verse 12, I will declare thy name, my brethren, in the midst of the church, will I sing praise unto thee. I will honor you for the sacrifices that you have made in this life. And the greater the sacrifices, the greater the honor. Again, he says in verse 13, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I am the children which God has given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. Almighty God became flesh and blood, walked among us. And the reason he did this is that through death, through his death on the cross, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Jesus has spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Back to verse 15 in chapter 2 of Hebrews. He has delivered them those who would be his followers, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. He has made us free, hallelujah, to walk victoriously before him. Verse 16, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He took on humanity. Wherefore, in all things it behoved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. In other words, he can identify with our suffering because he too suffered. He can identify with our hunger. He can identify with our heartache. He wept when his friend Lazarus died. Jesus knows suffering. He understands it. And because he himself has suffered and he has been tempted, he is able to secure or to relieve those who are tempted. Friends, I do not believe even when we get to the kingdom, we will ever fully understand the price that our Savior paid for us. Our minds, even at its fullest capacity, cannot begin to contemplate, to comprehend, to understand 
how an almighty God, wrapped in glory and majesty, stepped out of the portals of heaven, entered into human flesh, and allowed himself to be mocked, to be spitten upon, to be beaten beyond recognition, to be captured like an animal, and brutally nailed to a cross, to a wooden structure, by his very creation of whom he was dying for. The very people whom he died for are the ones who are killing him. How wonderful a truth this is, and yet how often it escapes us. It flutters through our mind, tickling our emotion, and yet before we have a chance to get a full grasp of it, it's gone. And we can spend hours, we can spend days, we can spend years, we can spend an eternity. And yet we will never fully understand what he has done for us. And that is why we will always remain low, remain humble, bowed before him in adoration and worship. Because he personifies love greater than anything we will ever know. And so even though we cannot fully apprehend the truth that lies in these pages, I would encourage you with all your effort and all your attention to focus of what Jesus offers unto you. Because even in the smallest of comprehension to this truth, there lies a deep and special blessing. He has suffered greatly that we might live victoriously. Oh, how he loves you and me, friends. Oh, how he loves you and me. But we're going to close there today. I'm so thankful that you're again with us, that you're sitting in the presence of the Lord before his awesome, wondrous word. And it is my prayer that day after day, the word of God is trickling into your soul and producing through your life rivers of living water. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you. And I'll see you on the next video.